Thank you. And these are both. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Tara, for a very, uh, very uh, nice introduction. Uh, this is actually one of my highlights um, of my year. I love uh, speaking to high school students. Um, and it's so wonderful that you come out here to enrich your own lives and then enrich those of your students. So I'm really honored to be here today. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, some of the work that I do. Um, I, uh, studying natural selection in the human lineage, so the evolution of humans. I do do a lot of work with Diane Worth studying the malaria genome, and this is much more focused on what uh, we've been investigating in the last um, decade or so about human evolution. Um, and obviously, it's an, a topic of interest with um, students and, and alike, so, and controversy. Um, so, it's cut off, but hopefully that'll, um, we'll see how that goes. But you can see it's the study of natural selection in humans. And I just want to start with a timeline. Um, just to give, to set kind of the, uh, the stage for the work that we do. Uh, it probably began in 1858, uh, for, uh, or that was a very big punctuation point. Um, the two, two guys here are Darwin and Wallace. In 1858, they published uh, joint papers on the theory of natural selection. And, you know, well before Darwin and Wallace um, proposed the, these theories, uh, scientists and, and non-scientists have been thinking about evolution. In fact, actually, probably um, dog breeders and pigeon <coughs> breeders um, and domesticators of, of plants were the ones that really were pushing the forefront of uh, species evolve. Um, and that thought was really out there. Um, but it wasn't, and, and I actually, the, the few folks that I always like to mention are uh, two major uh, uh, theorists who are important in Darwin and Wallace's work was Malthus, so the socioeconomic uh, economist Malthus who said that um, basically there's a struggle for resources and sort of this, this struggle of the resources that exist. And then Lyle who uh, published the principles of geology who really set out that the earth is changing. Um, so basically he was saying that the earth changes around us and these two kind of these two thoughts together came and congealed and were very formative for Darwin and Wallace in coming out with the principle of natural selection. Um, uh, Anyway, so in 1859, uh, Darwin published The Origin of Species, and it really moved into kind of the common parlance, uh, a lot of controversy with, amongst a lot of people that, you know, it, it had been talked about before, but that's really what sort of started to brew the storm of controversy around evolution. And in 1871, when Darwin published The Descent of Man, it became, uh, you know, it's it sort of adding to the fire that it's not just species on Earth, it's not the animals and plants around us, but we ourselves are part of that evolution. But really, since that time, there are very few, uh, there, there was actually, it took about 70 years until there was an example, right? So there was a, the idea that humans were evolving, but what was the evidence? Um, and probably the first evidence um, that, I, that I've seen is in 1948. And that was actually when J.B.S. Haldane, he's one of the founders of population genetics. And um, Haldane made, a, a, made an observation of the natural world. Um, Haldane, uh, it's called the malaria hypothesis. And in essence, he made an observation. He said there are, very, there are a lot of red blood cell disorders all around the world. So thalassemia, sickle cell anemia, ovalocytosis, and they always seem to be occurring in tropical regions of the world, and in particular in regions where malaria was endemic. And since malaria does infect the red blood cells, his hypothesis was somehow these things may have come to be because they protect from malaria. And just a few years later, someone named A.C. Allison, who actually I think lives in Cambridge, um, came, uh, in the 50s basically showed that indeed um, sickle cell anemia, the geographical distribution of sickle cell anemia, very closely matches uh, the geographical distribution of malaria in Africa. And individuals who carry the sickle cell mutation uh, or trait, as he was looking at that time, are protected from malaria. Um, and so that was really the first example. Um, and since that time, very sh actually very shortly after, uh, the evidence started flooding that indeed the sickle cell anemia, thalassemia, ovocytosis, G6PD deficiency, all these things were indeed protecting from malaria. And we can think of a lot of other forces that would drive evolution. We can think of um, other infectious diseases, um, so uh, malaria is carried by mosquito anopheles, that's a picture, but we can think of lots of infectious diseases that might be driving. We can think of changes in climate and temperature, um, domestication of plants and animals, changing what we're eating and, and our diets, um, and the constant need to reproduce and have many, many children. So there are many different forces that we might think of, but actually very, very few examples um, 
uh, that, that exists. So in the 1990s, lactose tolerance was shown. Um, the ability to drink milk into adulthood, that's probably one of the, the, mo the strongest uh, signals of evolutionary pressure in Europe, is the ability to drink milk that uh, arose after the domestication of cattle. The reason why we know that this hemoglobin, so HBB is the hemoglobin gene, um, and lactase, the lactose uh, tolerance uh, gene, um, is under such strong selection is not only do we have this biological story, but actually if you look at the genomes, there's a very distinctive signal of selection that is left behind in the DNA that tells you that there's a footprint of basically evolution that occurred. And now with data that we have in the last decade from the whole genome, we see that not just these two regions of the genome, but many, many regions of the genome have signals of selection just like hemoglobin and lactase. And the challenge now is to figure out what all those things have been doing. So what are the types of signals of selection? So here I'm just showing a cartoon, so one, two, three, so of six individuals in a population, <laughs> but just a cartoon to give you a schematic. Um, and this is what would happen in the absence of selection. So it, and just a random mutation occurs in the population uh, in, an, in an individual. And originally that mutation is going to be one copy in the entire population. So if it's two chrom uh, for the autosomes, you have two copies of the chromosome. So the original prevalence in the population is actually 1 over 2n, where n is the population size. So very rare in a, in a large population. And it will slowly start to spread as that person goes on to have a child and passes, if they pass on that mutation to the child. Uh, and so they may or they may not. They may pass it on to two children. Um, but it sort of ebbs and flows by a process called genetic drift. Um, so it's a sort of stochastic process they call drift, where the prevalence of the mutation um, sort of slowly starts to rise. It actually, most mu new mutations just disappear, just in some, you know, by, by chance they just don't, they aren't passed on. So, but whether it disappears or continues to rise, it'll take a very long time for it to achieve a high prevalence in the population. So now let's think about selection. So you have the same kind of individuals in the, at, at the first generation, and a mutation occurs now. And what it does is it enhances the survival or the reproductive success of the person who carries it, right? So that mutation is somehow beneficial, and that person is more likely to survive and reproduce. So they're more likely to pass on that mutation to their children, and their children are more likely to pass on that mutation to their children's children. So what will happen is it will rise in prevalence in a short period of time. So on the, when you look at the genome, when you look at the chromosomes, uh, this is the kind of pattern that you see. So here's our before. And there's our after, right? Where we had one, actually before there were no copies in the population, at some point one copy emerged. And then after there are many copies in the population. So we have a chromosome here. And, and in the last few years, we've gotten data from polymorphisms across all of the different chromosomes. And so here's a cartoon again, just to orient you. Of, I have five polymorphic loci, so five polymorphisms across the genome. Um, and so I'm, I'm marking each of these green or purple, and green would be uh, the ancestral state, what it was like before the mutation occurred, and purple is the new mutation that arose. Okay? And in this case, red, I'm marking for the selected mutation, which would have been the new mutation that was selected. And there's two processes that generate diversity. Right? There's mutation that are generating new variants in the population, and then there's recombination that reshuffles the way those mutations uh, lie next to each other on a chromosome. So when mutations arise over generations, they start reshuffling on lots of different backgrounds. And you can see that these <coughs> mutations are all on many different chromosomal backgrounds. But when selection happens, if the mutation rises very, very quickly in the population, it'll happen so quickly that there won't actually be time for that reshuffling process to take place. Um, and so that not just that mutation, but the entire chromosome uh, sort of context that it's in rises to high prevalence. And so you'll see something like this, which looks by eye different from here, but it's hard to detect in, in genomic data. But there are signals that it's leaving behind in our DNA. So one type of signal is something called a long haplotype, and this is the type of work I did in my PhD for a while, and let me just try to uh, explain what's going on. Actually, if the thing goes to 100 percent, if it totally um, goes to 100 percent in the population, what it'll just do is completely drive out all the variants in the population, right? So if, remove that bottom one there, and, and you see that if everyone looks like this, It'll look like a region of the genome where there's no polymorphisms whatsoever. Um, so that's the strongest thing. And here I'm talking about how we might be detect things that are not as clear cut. Um, and essentially, so this first thing, this long range correlation or long haplotype is, is, is this. So what we do is we take a variant. So let's take this variant right in the middle here uh, of this before picture. And, and we're going to take that green variant right in the middle. 
you'll look to the left and to the right of it, and you're trying to see how many recombination events occurred or how much recombinations occurred. So what you say is like, take all the individuals who are green and look to the left of them, um, and what, what do they look like? Well, sometimes they're green, so three out of five times they're green, and two out of five times they're purple. So we make this little, what we call um, this sort of this bifurcation diagram, just showing how. Uh, so this basically, this green and purple shows a recombination event that likely occurred in the population. And then we see that the, that green variant, is, so let's say if you're green and then you're tied to a purple, if you move one down, what are you tied to? So green, purple, and then purple, and in this case, green, purple, and then green. So you show another split. And basically what you're doing is you're looking at all of the splits that have historically happened in this region, and it'll tell you something about how long ago the mutation occurred. And so this mutation occurred some time ago because all the different kinds of possible splits that could occur have occurred. Whereas, of course, in this case, it's very extreme. In this case, there haven't been any recombination events at all. Um, and so the individuals always, that's red, is always green and then purple. Right? Um, and, and you basically can use that. And what you're looking for are things that are very common in the population. So you look at the variant, and you say, this looks very you know, common. But when you look at the haplotype context that it's in, you say, this is very recent. So that's one type of signal that we look for. Another type of signal is something called a high frequency of derived allele. So there's a lot of jargon here, so we'll just go through. Um, so when you have a polymorphism, you have two different alleles, right? And we can say that one of them is the ancestral allele. One of them was the allele that was present uh, b you know, before a mutation ever occurred. And then a mutation occurred, and it generated what we call the derived allele. So we're going to look at the ancestral versus the derived allele. Um, and the way that we figure out what is ancestral and what is derived is we look at close relatives. So we look at other species. So it's, t it's a sort of it's a lecture in of, it of itself, but essentially the lifespan of most mutations, most polymorphisms in the population, in the human population are a few million years. So how long ago, does anyone know how long ago we split from chimpanzees? See, this is a good audience, yeah. I mean, you, I, I can be in an uh, audience of, you know, PhD scientists, and they have no idea. So, but teachers are amazing at that. So yes, five to seven million years ago, we split um, from, from chimpanzees. And so that's much longer ago than we would expect the lifespan of a polymorphism. So pretty much all the polymorphisms we see, not, it's not 100% true, but for, for the most part, all the polymorphisms we see today in the human population occurred after the split between chimpanzees. So if you then look and you say, well, what's the allele that exists in chimpanzees, that'll tell you what the ancestral allele is. Often it, what's good is to look at a couple of closely related species, so chimp and gorilla, and say, yes, that was the allele that was present. And what looks like happened is this new allele emerged, and that's the derived allele. And actually, I, I wrote a you know, paper recently on ethics. And it's important that we think you know, chimps are not ancestral to us just because we're, we're saying that, right? We're actually all distant cousins, very distant cousins. So we can do the same thing. If there's a polymorphism in chimpanzees we're interested in, we look at the human allele, and we say that's the ancestral allele. But in essence, we know what the ancestral and the derived allele is. Um, and so we're looking for this recent rise of a new allele. And remember, in that first uh, figure that I showed you, the first sort of population figure I showed you, I, in the absence of selection, those new alleles take very long time. The derived alleles take a very long time to rise to high prevalence. So, uh, so that basically most derived alleles are at very low prevalence in the population. And again, uh, another piece of jargon is prevalence is called frequency, um, which I know physicists don't like that frequency is used so wildly, wildly, but basically the frequency in the population is how prevalent it is. So most of these are pretty low frequency, but when that chromosome, uh, that mutation spreads through the population and takes the entire chromosome with it, it'll take other derived alleles, so you'll see a local rise in derived alleles. Okay, and then the other type of signal, the third type of classic population genetic signal that we look for is differentiation. So now that you got the chimp one, uh, I'll try to stump you again. Um, does anyone know, so how long ago did human populations move out of Africa? Did the major continental population separate? You're just a ray, yeah, so okay, we got a winner. Um, yeah, so about, yeah, 40 to 6, 50, to, it's somewhere within the 50 to 75,000 year range. Um, you know, the numbers obviously vary, but it's somewhere in that context within the last 100,000 years. That's not a very long period of time in geological time. Uh, it's not a long time for, for va variation to change that much or drift to occur that much. So in general, in the human genome, humans are very closely related. And not only do they share the same polymorphisms, but they're often at the same frequencies in different populations. But in places where you see like a very stark difference, so in this case, 
um, in this picture right here, where uh, the white is showing that there's a mutation totally absent outside of Africa. In parts of Africa, it's, um, it's showing that it gets up to 100%. That's a very stark difference, and that often is pointing to natural selection. And in this case, this is the Duffy locus, or DARC locus, um, that uh, a null mutation in this gene protects from plasmodium vivax malaria. So this kind of difference, you can look across and look for peaks in the genome for highly differentiated variants. And essentially, now we have the ability to do that in, a very, in just a very short uh, recent time, and that was with all these data sets that became available. And the data sets include um, complete genomes of all these different species, like humans, but also chimpanzees, uh, mouse, gorilla, um, lots of different closely related species which we can use and compare and study. We have large databases of known genetic variation as we sequence more and more human, human individuals. We got to know how much variation exists in the human population. And then we started, we went out on a few efforts to actually then um, catalog that variation in continental populations. So we looked in Africa, Europe, and Asia, and we saw what were the frequencies in the larger set of individuals. Um, and finally, now we have really large sets of full sequence data. We're moving, and I think uh, Eric Lander gave a talk the other day at our, our retreat, and essentially shows that we are well exceeding Moore's law, where in just every year we are um, going, you know, 100 times, 1,000 times faster in our ability to generate data. So we have just volumes of data, and for the first time we can really do these genomic scans for evolution. And we've um, basically, the process that you're doing is you are just moving across. You have a different test based on one of these signals that we talked about. Um, and you just move across the genome and look for a, something that's a sort of smoking gun, something that signals that. And here's just some, um, you know, and, and different uh, individuals develop different kinds of software. So this is software developed by Patrick Verley, Ben Fry, and Ilya Schlachter to do this kind of analysis um, on a genome scale. And this is uh, just a picture of some of the regions that we found. So many different groups across the world scanned these data sets and found, each found hundreds of regions uh, in genome surveys that look unusual. Um, but essentially, again, this is just a quagmire. There's so many regions up here, um, and these are large regions. These are often, the thing is that when it takes that entire chunk of the chromosome up with it, these may be megabase long regions that you're looking at, and somewhere in there, there was maybe <coughs> one mutation that was important, and how do you know which one it is? So actually, when you look at it, there is just a handful of positions in the genome where we actually know what the mutation is and what it does, right? So we have all these regions, and, and people make stories for all of them, but really the next challenge is to say, okay, what in that one megabase region was the thing that was the important thing? So essentially, this is just a picture that shows why this is so hard, is it's a long process, I and mean, you start with the signal of selection. Um, somewhere in the genome and then try to go along in this process where the signal of selection may be, you know, just some region of the chromosome and some population where selection occurred in. Um, and then you need to find the target variant. You need to find the normal function of that target genomic locus. Um, try to find out what the variation does functionally. If you have other signals in the pathway, it helps you because if you see something that seems to be recurring, basically convergent evolution, it's signaling that something might interesting might be happening. Um, and then finally, you get to the evolutionary adaptation. So these are basically, this is just a picture from, um, uh, actually I should cite it, but basically I did something for nature education um, on this. And basically this is a picture of, uh, example of what, what we know about. And this is about as many things as we, you know, there's a few more, but that we really know about. Um, and in it would be the hemoglobin lactase tolerance, one of the uh, important pigment genes uh, under selection in Europe. But essentially in all these cases, we have a signal of selection. We know the locus. Uh, we know the variation that we are interested in. We know where, where it's located in and what that uh, region of the genome does. Um, and we know what the variation changes. We have other signals in the pathway that are saying, you know what, this might be important. Um, and then we have an evolutionary adaptation, some sort of an explanation. So for hemoglobin, it's protection from malaria. For lactose tolerance, it's the ability to drink milk after the domestication of cattle. For pigment, it's lighter skin uh, as, we move, as humans move to less sunlight, and there are different hypotheses as to why that's important. Um, and then down here, we just have kind of some examples of things that are just not as far along, where there is information. We, you know, we have a region of the chromosome. We have, a, uh, have some information about where the mutation is and what the mutation does, but we don't yet have an evolutionary explanation. And other things were very, uh, not very far along. One of the signals in Asia is a mutation, a non synonymous mutation that causes dry earwax. Um, and of course, uh, yeah, it'll be a while before we get a good evolutionary explanation for why that, that's occurred. But um, yeah. 
But there are some other ones that are intriguing. And it's telling you, a lot of times it tells you evolution is really surprising you. It's not telling you, you know, you think you could guess, but um, it's a mystery. So basically, I told you about these different kinds of signals. And in most of the studies that have been done, in fact, I think all the studies that have been done to date will essentially use one of the signals and say, well, we're, we're using this tool or we're using this tool. And I'm pretty agnostic, um, you know, and politically, uh, religiously, in every way. So I said, you know what, I'm just going to use all the tests because, um, frankly, uh, the, the um, mutation under selection, while the region may have different things going on, the mutation under selection should have all of those signals that we're detecting, if it was a recent mutation. And when I say recent, I'm really talking about the last about 30,000 years or so uh, of, of where I'm investigating and the kind of domain that I'm interested in. And in that domain, basically, that mutation is likely the derived mutation that rose very quickly and took a big chunk of the chromosome with it. Um, and, and if it was a local selective pressure, it would drive differences between populations. So we thought maybe if we use all these things, we'll locate in on the region. And we developed, a sort of out, we developed something called a composite likelihood statistic. But essentially, it is, takes the, we take a, for each mutation in the genome, we take uh, the score that it gets by each of these kinds of tests. And then we say, what's the probability this is the causative mutation, the selected mutation, given the score that it has um, by this test? And then we sum those likelihoods across all the different tests, and we give an ultimate score of its likelihood to be the causative mutation. Um, and uh, basically, we apply that, we call it the composite of multiple signals, to um, lots of regions. So we applied it to all these regions that we're talking about where we, we really don't know what's going on. Um, so I'm not going to show you all the different kinds of tests and how they would have performed, but here's just what the uh, long haplotype, so that first kind of test I showed you before. The problem with the long haplotype is it's very powerful, but it's so powerful that all of the polymorphisms within that region will be dragged up on a long haplotype, so all of them will have a long signal. And so you can look, and across the 600 kilobase region, there are many, many um, polymorphisms with a very high score, and it's really hard within that region to mine out and see what's going on. So we applied our CMS test, and it looked like this. So essentially, basically, because all of those tests are quite independent, um, it reduces the noise. Basically, you could have a high score by one test, but the probability of having high, sky high score by all tests is very low, um, unless you're the causative mutation or right next to the causative mutation. So essentially, uh, the, the, so it normally, this test really comes down to a very strong peak, because the only things that look almost exactly like the causative mutation are ones that are totally linked to it, really close by in the genome. So basically, in this, it comes down to five things with significant scores, and our mutation is right there, the threonine to alanine change. So what's nice is, sorry, I didn't actually explain that, was we first began by applying it to regions we knew. We, so here's basically the pigment gene um, that I was talking about before, and there's an amino acid change, a threonine to an alanine, um, in the gene SLC24A5 that causes um, pigment differences. Um, and so basically, our signal came right down to that gene within this whole 600 kilobase context. Um, and the gene has been shown in zebrafish to be critical for pigment. Um, and that threonine to alanine change has been shown to be responsible for about 30 percent of uh, pigment differences within Europeans. Um, and so we actually, th that was a mutation that had been very well characterized. But there have, in this big surveys that have been done that make, identify these megabase long chunks, a lot of times they will have a pigment gene in there, and the scientists will hypothesize, well, maybe it's the pigment gene. But in no, none of the cases is it clear that it's the pigment gene. A lot of times there'll be 20 other genes in that region, but they just you know, pull out and say the pigment gene is in there. Um, so we, we, we took those regions and we said, OK, here's four different pigment genes that showed up in genome-wide scans. And we looked within these uh, megabase long regions and said, within them, where does the signal localize to? Is it localizing to the pigment gene or to some other gene? And actually, in all cases, it always localized to the pigment gene. So we we're quite uh, lucky there. It could have actually been, even if it was related to the pigment gene, it could have been somewhere else um, nearby. But actually, so these are Matt P, TRIP1, HERS2, and Kit Ligand. In all of these cases, it came, the red right there, these are the genes underneath it. And the red is the gene of interest. And it always comes down to that gene. And in many cases, it gives a very, very strong candidate amino acid change. So that was interesting. Kit Ligan is actually quite interesting because there are two peaks that form. Now, it could be that it was a single selective sweep, a single event, but it just sort of created noise as it rose. Or it could be that there are two independent events that occurred, so one sweep. Uh, so we call that a sweep, basically, was that chromosome sweeps up in the population. So it could have been that one occurred and then another occurred. And what's interesting for those two sweeps is 
One lies right on top of kit ligand, the other one lies right on top of a, the regulatory region. So here's a transcription factor um, that's the top score in that region. So uh, we, you know, we're, we're hitting both kit ligand and its regulatory region. Um, and so basically, in this kind of context, we start seeing this picture is getting filled out. Right before, we have you know, infectious disease probably being an important force of selection, and hemoglobin being a good example of that, and metabolism being important with lactose tolerance being an example of that. And now we have the pigment genes. And in addition to cell cell C245, we're really showing, yes, these other pigment genes were the critical drivers of evolution. Um, but so we can start looking and now looking at some other regions. So this is actually a region that we already knew about as well, but we published just in 2007 um, in a study I did with Eric Lander. Um, and basically, it's, this is an 800 kilobase region with a very wide peak. And again, it comes down to really four significant variants. And right at the top there is this amino acid change in the gene EDAR. Um, and basically, so within this whole region, um, it comes down to a very tight locus with this very one, very high score, this valine to alanine change in EDAR. And um, let me actually give you a little story or backdrop on EDAR. So actually, when I first discovered this uh, signal, I was incredibly excited because um, in the literature, I already knew that David Kingsley had done some tremendous work on EDAR, or on the EDA pathway. So David Kingsley is a developmental biologist from Stanford, and he had shown that that pathway, that EDA pathway, it's ectodysplasian, um, and it's important for ectodermal differentiation, is under strong selection in stickleback fish. So this is a stickleback fish that is in seawater, and this is the same kind of stickleback fish, but in freshwater. And essentially, they were always losing their scale. So in seawater, a lot of the fish have scales to probably body armor to protect them from predators um, and other important uh, properties. In freshwater, they decided to lose that scale because it's probably expensive to make, probably decreases their ability to absorb nutrients, and is just not as needed. So they were repeatedly losing their scale. And he showed a very strong signal of evolution in those fish to lose that through this pathway. So that same genomic type signal he found in the fish. In humans, it doesn't obviously regulate scale, but it regulates another um, ectodermal uh, it, it regulates ectodermal function. It regulates hair, sweat, and teeth. So essentially, there's a disease called hypohydratic ectodermal dysplasia um, that uh, is, points us to why this gene is important. If you knock out that gene, you have very little, you have basically no body hair, no body uh, sweat glands, um, and malformations of teeth. So that's how we know what the function is. Um, but in Asia, where this is under selection, we started to investigate what might be going on, what's actually the pressure. Um, and a few things that we did, this is Yana Kambaroff, who works with me and Cliff Tabin, um, who's working up a lot of this, um, this stuff. But essentially, in the 2007 paper, we showed, we just did a protein model, and we showed that that mutation lies in a very important part of the gene and probably the binding domain. Um, and in fact, so there's the red, that our mutation, and green um, and yellow are both recessive and dominant mutations that cause HED. So essentially, we see that that disease, what's going on, knocking out of the gene, is, is all very uh, close by um, and maybe related. Uh, people have been doing some really good groups, actually, in Asia have been doing work to show what the phenotype might be, what is the change. And the first thing, there was a study where they just had hair diameter, so the width of the hair on the head. Um, and they showed that individuals who carry the Asian allele, the selected allele, have double the hair size width as, um, uh, as one, individuals who don't carry it. And, basically, and the heterozygotes are um, an intermediate. But essentially, um, in Asia, uh, you see that long, thick, straight hair that's been driven by this mutation. And this uh, study, another study, just overexpressed that gene. So this wasn't really looking at the mutation, but just saying, what would happen if you just really overexpressed um, that EDAR gene? And they made a mouse model. And they, I always have to disclaim, this is the title of the paper. I don't call this the East Asian hair form, but this is what they're getting at. Um, is essentially, uh, it's just not a, uh, it's essentially is a uh, thick and straight. So if you just look at that closely, it does look like a porcupine, but really what they're pointing at is that um, it's very, very thick, straight hair. Um, and finally, actually, I said that uh, East Asians have something you may or may not know about. They used to call it the oriental cusp, but it's actually, in Asians, is something called tooth shoveling. So behind our, uh, my front teeth, it's totally straight. It's very flat. But um, behind a lot of Asians' teeth, it looks like a shovel. It's a, there's a ridge. And that same ridge is also driven by this mutation. So not clear what's going on, but there's a lot of really interesting phenomena. 
Um, and what's interesting is not just that gene that I'm pointing to, but other genes in that pathway are also our top signals. So EDAR and EDAR add also merge. So we're seeing another pathway. So we see not only a single mutation that has an interesting phenotype, but a pathway. Hair, sweat, teeth, these are things that might be driven by evolution. Um, I often get asked, you know, what's going on there, right? When I talk about sickle cell, people like that story. Even pigment, they get it. But then you, say, you start talking about hair and sweat, and people get kind of um, confused. But actually, I always say, I started showing this picture, and I said, you know, if you were to ask a child what were the biggest differences between chimpanzees if you did a photo hunt exercise and said, what's the difference between this picture? What's that? Clothes. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. So there are, there are the shorts and the glasses. That, this is true. But probably the child would immediately say they're hairy, right? So, um, it, is the, it is probably one of the biggest differences between us um, is the amount of body hair that we have. And in general, we shouldn't be surprised that what we do on our surface is going to be under strong pressure, right? It's how we're interacting with the environment. Um, and as we do different things, we need to sweat more, we need to sweat less, we need to um, have more hair to protect ourselves. There's a lot of things that are going on that actually in all animals we see that change of pattern as being very important. Um, and so it's not clear why Asians have lost so much more body hair than other human populations. It may have something to do with the humidity and the wetness in the environment that they're at, uh, something that we're just beginning to explore. Um, here's some examples of things that haven't really been discovered uh, or, or described uh, before. So this is actually un unpublished data, but um, uh, from uh, our scans, our recent scans. And here's another gene where we localize to uh, a gene, protocadherin 15. Um, and within it, uh, there's an aspartic acid to alanine change that we're interested in. So again, we have a nice peak, and we have a very big, very big change in aspartic acid to alanine change within this gene, protocadherin. And this is a very key role in sensory hair cells. So um, and this is under strong selection in Asia on chromosome 10. And mutations in this gene cause something called Usher syndrome, which leads to deafness and blindness uh, and balance problems. Again, these are just clues to what the phenotype might be, but obviously they wouldn't be ex explaining those. And so we looked at where is that mutation, this aspartic acid to alanine change, and it's in a key cadherin domain. And interestingly, when you look in the mammalian lineage, we've sequenced 34 mammals, and in all 34 mammals, it's always aspartic acid. So that means it's a very conserved region of the genome. Um, and if you actually look all the way back to, it's funny, my students like to say, like, all the way back to lamprey, and now they say all the way back to platypus, but basically all the way back through the entire vertebrate lineage, um, it is... Um, always an acid, so it sometimes is a glutamic acid, but this is something that's highly conserved to be an acid. And suddenly you're changing it to alanine, which is a huge change. Um, so it seems like that might make a difference, so we look to see what, where is that mutation and why, what effect it might have. So I said again, it's a sensory hair cell, um, and it's very important in, in keeping these um, uh, in place and for the structure of these things. And that aspartic acid in a protein prediction model seems to hold the calcium in place. So essentially, the, the aspartic acid circle around calcium and um, calcium molecules, and that's important for the structure of the protein. And what we've done is we've changed an aspartic acid to an alanine. So it seems like it would have a major effect on the protein conformation. And we're trying to figure out uh, what the effect is there, but, um, and we're now doing a very big study in China uh, with um, Li Jin, who's at the Fudan University, trying to explore different phenotypes this might be driving. Um, the interesting thing is, again, in Asia, as we looked in Asia, um, we found many genes that are expressed in, uh, that cause either Usher syndrome or expressed in um, uh, hair cells or in the ear that are under selection. So we're not clear as to what's going on, but it seems like two major things is that we're seeing um, in Asia is hair and sweat changes and also sensory perception changes, something to, to explore. Okay, and so just a few more of these kind of little storytellings. Um, here's another, chromosome 12, Africa trait unknown. Um, and again, it, cle it cleans to a very strong peak, and then, and then another one just flying here, but a strong peak, and that peak is all in the gene power. Originally, essentially, when people talk about these large regions under selection, um, they pointed to this neurotransmitter here as maybe being the driver because it's in the brain and that's probably sexy and, or whatever the case may be. It's actually also the big gene in the region, so that's another uh, reason to include it. But actually, it's this very small gene, this immune gene, that seems to be the driver. Um, and this immune gene is very important in actually antigen stimulation in T cells. Uh, and we, so, so kind of it may be that it is an infectious, important in some sort of an infectious disease. And when we looked, actually, um, so 
folks have done a lot of work recently at looking at gene expression, so the, exp the amount of a gene that is made. So there's two kind there are different kinds of changes that can happen to genes. Right? You can change an amino acid and just change the structure of the gene, or you can change something in its regulation so that you make more or less of it. Um, and essentially, there have been lots of studies that show uh, variation that is associated with expression changes. And so we, we were mining these databases, and we saw that, in fact, for power and only for power, the only gene in that region, um, and only in West Africa, the population that, where it's under selection, that there is a strong signal of a gene expression change. And, and in fact, actually, those mutations that are strong signals of selection are the same ones that are the strong signals of gene expression. So we don't know exactly what's going on there, but we do think that whatever the selection was, it was modulated by changes in how much, gene, how much of the gene you're making. Um, and uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but there are many, many other genes involved in infectious disease that emerge in our data set. So the great thing is with this approach, the CMS approach, we localize to single regions, and we can look in those regions and see what are the genes that are there. And we see lots and lots of genes that have been linked to infectious disease. So many of the malaria genes. Also, I'll um, uh, talk about a little bit uh, two genes large in IL-21 that are important um, in uh, uh, something called Lassa virus and arena viruses, VDR, which actually is under selection in West Africa and is associated with tuberculosis resistance in West Africa, um, Rho A and DAG1 that are important for Yersinia pestis, bubonic plague, um, and for leprosy. So we're seeing a lot of signals that are surrounding them. We don't know if that's what's going on, but it's intriguing. Um, and finally, a couple more genes that I'll just show is again, so you'll, uh, we kind of, our lab got very excited about this fade away. So we sort of use the fade away. You'll get the idea. We fade away. We have another beautiful peak. Um, and again, uh, localizing within a region with 18 genes in the region. So you really would have a hard time. But then again, coming down to just two genes. And one of them uh, I'll talk about in a second because it'll end up being important, is important in uh, lipid and glucose homeostasis. It's called USF1. Um, and it's also actually important in infectious disease. Uh, and this is under selection in Africa. And again, we see that um, EQTL, basically, a link to gene expression. Um, and again, within all the genes in the region, there's only one that shows a strong link to expression changes. And it only is a link to expression changes in West Africa, where the selection is found. So again, we don't know what USF1 is doing, but we know that whatever that change was, it was probably linked to a, a biological change in the amount of the gene that's being made. Um, and this one, which is another uh, region with 800 KB long and five genes, and it comes down to a single gene. And within that, we see another big amino acid change that's um, right at the top here in the, in the leptin receptor. Is anyone? So, so yeah, all right, so anyone who watches sort of diet commercials knows the le and, or, or follows this kind of thing is the leptin receptor being very important um, and um, linked to uh, body weight and body mass. Um, and so basically, the, and, and you can see the, the little the leptin uh, mice, right? So the cute, cute little chubby mice. And they, um, and basically, this leptin receptor is important in body weight regulation. And this is an amino acid change. It's an arginine to lysine change. And that's very important in ubiquination. So the ar arginines are, are signaled to be ubiquinated. And the lysine change essentially changes the ubiquination state without changing the structure. Um, so it's an important regulatory change. Um, and this specific arginine to lysine mutation is associated with BMI differences. And in, and in fact, there's a study in Asia where, where we find the signal selection showing that that mutation changes the body mass index. So, uh, so you know, it's not clear what's going on, but we find these interesting stories. And I'm obviously not going to, uh, I, I love the fadeaways, but we'll just do kind of one more fadeaway where we show lots of different uh, regions that are pinpointing in. And in each of them, we're going in and trying to figure out what they do. Um, and the nice thing is just broadly is that it's really starting to fill out the picture. And in the last year or two, we're able, you know, and in, and in the coming years, we're going to really be able to fill out this picture and see not just single genes that we're interested in, but whole pathways that seem to be evolving. And I don't show it here, but we did basically another kind of statistic where we just said, are certain pathways enriched, right? So not just certain genes, but are there certain enrichments in pathways? And indeed, we see lots of enrichment in genes for sensory perception under selection in Asia, and enrichment for immune genes under selection in Africa. Um, and we also see um, metabolism enrichment uh, across the board. So there are these interesting phenomena going on. And uh, just in the last part of the talk, I'm just going to talk about one of the things that we know less about, um, but that are really pointing us to exciting areas of study. So. Um, 
you know, all of these basically point you in new directions where there's something you didn't even know about that might have been very important that suddenly might be incredibly critical and might be uh, a key to the survival of the human species. So it's very interesting. And so here's a signal on chromosome 22 um, that is the strongest signal of selection in Africa. Uh, and basically, it was, it was one population in Africa, the Yoruba of Nigeria, that were studied um, in this big study um, that was done of the genome. And so in the Yoruba of Nigeria, the strongest signal of selection is on chromosome 22. And it's this basically this sort of, you see this long haplotype. It's likely about a 40% allele, so allele at 40% prevalence in the population, that's spread within the last 10,000 years to incredibly, this incredibly high prevalence. Um, and so we see this signal within the gene large. And when we run our CMS localization, this is the original signal in gray. And it comes down to a very strong peak of just 22 kilobases in exon 1 and exon 2 of the gene. Um, and when we look to see what does this gene do and why is this under selection, it was very interesting because it does, has a lot of functions. But a very important function of the gene large is that it's critical for um, arena viruses entering cells. So basically, it modifies alpha dystroglycan, which is the cellular receptor of arena viruses. And if you knock out uh, large, arena viruses can't, they need that modification in order to signal and come into the cell. You knock out large, you don't get arena viruses. So what are arena viruses? Well, they're not sort of um, as popularly known, but there is one that is incredibly pathogenic and very important called Lassa virus. Um, and so this gene is shown to be also one of the viruses shown in that study was Lassa virus. You knock out large, you cannot get Lassa virus entering the cells. And essentially, um, it was one of these kind of, science is very fun. And there's a lot of late night discoveries you do, you know, three in the morning, after you've tried to PubMed the word large for a long time and gotten nowhere, um, and then realize you're gonna have to be more creative and you get that paper. And then you look and you say, well, wow, that's really interesting because Lassa virus is named after Nigeria. And remember that was where the signal, the association was found. So, I always say this, you know, this could be incredibly fortuitous or it could be a red herring that's going to take me straight off of a cliff, but um, it's very interesting. And what was interesting is that, though, is that, you know, I went to medical school and I'd never really heard about Lassa virus, and I looked in my microbiology textbook and there's only one mention of it in a table, um, but it's not talked about. Um, but, uh, and, and, you know, there's some people that say it kills about 20,000 people, but that's, there's incredibly good researchers in Lhasa, but there's, it's just a handful of them, and they're, 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 they're well undermanned. So there have been very few studies of, uh, of Lhasa exposure. Um, one of the few studies was a very small, a couple of small studies done by the WHO, where they did sero surveys of Lhasa. And it looks like what's interesting is that even though it's probably killing just a handful of people in Nigeria, 21% um, of Nigerians have sero positivity. So have likely been exposed to Lhasa. That's about 30 million people that have been exposed to this disease, Lhasa, um, with, with tens of thousands of deaths. Um, and if you look, actually, this is where it's very endemic. Um, in Sierra Leone and parts of Sierra Leone and Liberia and Guinea, it's over 50% of the population has likely been exposed. What is shocking about that, well, actually, what, why that is not surprising that many people have been exposed is that this little, cute little guy here, um, looks really sweet, and if you came into your kitchen late at night, you might not mind, except he's carrying a virus that is as potent as Ebola in his blood at all times. So basically, in most of West Africa, these little rodents, mastimus, are persistently infected with Lhasa. And Lhasa is, uh, don't, you know, don't be surprised by the fact that you haven't heard of it, it is a Category A agent, like Ebola, like bubonic plague, like um, uh, smallpox. But it is unlike those that are either naturally eradicated or just a handful of cases, um, this is widely, widely prevalent. So you're talking about an Ebola-like virus that's running around. Uh, you know, I, I was, when I give this to high school, when I give this to like college dorms, I say that little guy that showed up in your kitchen at night has Ebola. Um, this is what these people are, yeah, not, uh, yeah, so, so be clean, be hygienic, but no. The, um, but this is essentially, but this is the state of affairs in most of West Africa, is that these guys are, uh, many are persistently infected. Um, and, uh, and, and actually, they're, um, yeah, and they're very, very prevalent. So you're talking about a Category A agent um, that is, can, can go airborne, so you have to work on it um, in a, in a spacesuit in a BL4 facility. Um, but it is a, cat a Category A agent that can kill you within a matter of weeks, um, but it is widespread. Um, and so our hypothesis, let's say that my signal selection at large is totally wrong, irrespective of that, you're talking about something that's widespread, um, that is deadly, but there are so many people that are uh, seemingly resistant to it. So we wanted to go in and in investigate why are they resistant and could this be a major signal of natural selection in the genome. 
Um, when you say it can go airborne, what does that mean? Does it go airborne? Um, there are been, so there have been a few episodes. Actually, early on when my graduate student, my first graduate student, I started working on this project. We were very excited. We were embarking on this and saying, oh my gosh, no one's even studied this before. Well, let's do it. Like, why does nobody study this thing? And then we saw on CNN somewhere in, you know, on the web that um, at Yale in the 80s, three, pe uh, three people were infected and somebody died. Um, and in that case, it was a guy down the hall who was not even working in the project, and they suspected it went through the air ducts. So um, there have been reports that suggest it can go airborne. It just it generally is likely spread through um, urine of the rodents or other kinds of things like that. But um, there are a couple of hospital outbreaks that have been quite severe. Um, in one case, there was a patient that came in. One of the big problems with Lhasa is that it's very undiagnosable. It's insidious. Um, where you just come in with a little bit of a fever and then you get abdominal pain and then in a short period of time you decompensate, go into coma, seizures, and death. And so people don't, it's very hard to diagnose in that early stage and by the time it's late stage there's not much you can do. And so the patient had come in, been treated for two weeks on the main hospital floor for anti-malarials because that's what it looks like. And in that period of time 17 people contracted it and died, or 17 people died from it, including a lot of the hospital staff. So that was an outbreak in Nigeria. There's also a recent outbreak that we were uh, brought in to be in engaged in of 31 people getting in the hospital. So it's not clear how it's being spread, but if it's that kind of wide, rapid spread, it may well have gone airborne. So there is evidence, and people con contest that, but it's a concern for sure, and it, why it has to be dealt with in, the, in a BL4 facility for that reason. Yes, yeah, you, you definitely want to take precautions. So, um, so we basically, I, I've been working with Christian Happy, this guy here, for several years in malaria with Diane Wirth. Um, and so together, and he uh, has some, had some great relationships in Arua where there was, had been known episodes of Lhasa. And so, um, and where they seem to have many, many cases. And a study actually by um, Stefan Gunther at Bernard Noch had shown that this is a place of, of uh, a lot of Lhasa. So we went there and we set up a diagnostic facility with Christian's lab um, and uh, a gener in generous donations from Harvard through my, through my startup. Um, and so this is basically our pictures of our from our lab. These are uh, the guys suited up to work. This is Eric Fellin, who's our project manager, helping set up the, the team on a data management system. And here is basically our, our systems of going and doing the diagnostics. And very modest diagnostics, PCR, electrophoresis, and basics. But essentially, we can do a PCR reaction, an RT-PCR reaction, and see whether or not Lhasa is present. And that's, like I said, very important in a disease that's very difficult to diagnose. Uh, is that now you can get an early diagnostic. When somebody comes in with a little bit of fever, you can immediately know. And there's actually, there is a treatment that works. So in a couple of these cases in the United States where they said, what do we do for these people? Um, essentially, if somebody tried ribavirin and realized actually it works. Um, so essentially, it's not FDA approved, but it's approved under the mercy laws in that it's something that's known to have been efficacious, so um, people have tried it. Um, and, uh, but essentially, before this time, there was no diagnostic facility. There were a few labs that could do the diagnostic, but there's no diagnostic facility in Nigeria to, to test for patients um, and no sort of treatment. So we essentially, together with uh, Bernard Nook University, we set up this first diagnostic um, and treatment site. And actually, Harvard donated the ribavirin, again, that was able to treat. Um, treat these patients. Uh, and this is essentially the kinds of things that we saw. So um, the study that Bernard Doch has done, had done before, that university had done before, showed that, um, uh, of the, and we went back to the records from those, the cases that were tested with, that were loss of positive, and the fatality rate was 70%. So basically two-thirds of the people that had come into the hospital during that study died of loss of virus. Um, what we saw is that essentially this is our LASA patients, um, and we had 50 LASA patients, and the ones that were diagnosed uh, in time to basically were diagnosed early and treated, the fatality rate was only 15%, whereas the fatality for ones that came in later in their course, uh, and we did not get, a, a, get in time for diagnostics, the fatality was 60%. So what we're seeing here is that the ribavirin is working. Um, and in fact, actually, in all the studies that have been shown before, they say that fatality for pregnant women is pretty much, um, you know, like most diseases, very bad for pregnant women. The child has a 100% fatality, basically, is, um, you know, almost impossible to survive, and the mother has a, over an 80% fatality rate. And we see that in this case, we've treated so far, I believe, four pregnant women who've all survived with the ribavirin. So it's very exciting. Um, 
But essentially, this kind of shows you something really exciting. I'm interested in human evolution, but as an MD, I'm very much interested in affecting health. And so we see that we start with this kind of random scan of the genome. And whether or not it's a real signal of evolution, it's taken me to a place I did not expect to be two years ago, which is setting up diagnostics in Nigeria, doing diagnostics, doing major collections. And what we were hoping to do now is we actually have a grant to sequence uh, thousands of Lassa virus, at least 1,500 viruses from around uh, Nigeria and in Sierra Leone. Uh, and we want to build better diagnostics to detect this early. And we also still want to see are those people that contain that gene, who have that gene large, uh, and the mutation in large, are they protected? And we want to see, are there other, there's actually another strong signal, um, IL-21, that's also important in arenaviruses, it's under selection in Africa. So are there signals of genetic resistance that are emerging? So, um, and so essentially, that's the story, and we're coming back to the, to the uh, timeline. Um, and it says, you know, and just to put it into that context, right, it was very slow going. I, I feel very fortunate because these Darwin and Wallace and, and Lyle and Math Malthus and all these people were exceptionally creative. They had very little data and they were able to pull out from the, you know, the, these small observations, very important, um, uh, make very important observations about evolution. But now, you know, and since that time, since 1948, when malaria resistance was shown, um, individual signals have been shown, and some of them hold up and some of them don't, but now we have data from the entire genome, and we're really kid, you know, kid in a candy store, where there's so many different signals that we're trying to explore, and not only can we explore the evolution of humans, but all sorts of species. These same tests can be applied to many, many species, and a lot of my work is to apply them to um, the malaria parasite, so um, one of uh, humans' most imp uh, important pathogens, and also the, the Lassa parasite, Lassa virus, sorry. Um, and we are doing a lot of work to explore that. So essentially, hopefully, I've shown you that these kinds of st studies, these statistical analyses of the genome, can really point us to a lot of the forces that are shaping our species, but also give us insights into human health. Um, and with that, uh, lots and lots of acknowledgments. So Sherry Grossman and Ilya Schlachter are the two people who drove all of that composite of multiple signals. And it's sort of been their uh, great work for over a year. Um, coming to a close, and they've had great collaborations with Eleanor Carlson and Steve Schaffner, a, a really great group in my lab, and Eric Lander, who's always being a support, and so many different groups that, that support us. And these two projects, actually, the International Hat Map and the Thousand Genomes, are generating all that data from many human populations that make this all possible. These are the pretty faces of the folks in our site in Arua. Uh, these folks from my lab uh, out there. Eleanor, Eric, Sherry, and Christian, and uh, the team. And there's Christian Happy. We have two Christians on our team, which is uh, very, uh, makes things complicated. But Christian Happy is our lead in Nigeria and is a tremendous, tremendous scientist. And I, these are, the, these are the, the folks that man the diagnostic facility. And um, aren't they beautiful? So they're, they're very photogenic, and they love to be, they love to, to pose for photos, but um, they're spectacular. And I always say, you know, it's, it's tremendous because they really, they work on a, an Ebola-like virus. Half the time they go and diagnose someone, by the time they come back to tell the person their result, the person's dead. I mean, they deal with so much. It's, you know, it's so overwhelming, yet they have such a smile on their face, and every morning they'd come and do their morning prayer, and I just have all the respect in the world for them. They are tremendous people. Um, and then what I didn't talk about so much is also, you know, I, I just have the great pleasure of working in a lot of just really exciting international collaborations, and this is work in Senegal uh, with Diane Wirth and with Eric Lander and our team here uh, in Boston and uh, the great Senegalese team that we work with. Um, and thank you. I'm reaching back to an old nova that survivors of the bubonic plague also have a resistance to HIV. Is that something that was swept along? Is there any accounting for that or any work on it? So actually, I wrote a paper um, I published in PLOS Biology a few years ago with the authors from that original paper that there was a study that showed that individuals who um, survive the bubonic plague have a variant um, that uh, likely now protects from HIV. Ori that study was originally done. It was a mutation called CCR5 Delta 32. Um, and it's basically in the uh, gene CCR5, which is a co-receptor on T cells for HIV. Um, and if you have a deletion in that, um, see the CCR5 delta 32 mutation, you don't get HIV. Um, and essentially, the study was dating that mutation, saying how long ago did it occur. And they dated it to about 700 years ago, and they hypothesized that perhaps um, 700 years ago was around the same time as the bubonic plague, and it seemed to be at a high prevalence in Europeans and not other places, so could that be what was going on? 
But in the study that we did since, um, we redated the mutation with new modern genetic data, um, and it seems to be over 5,000 years old. Um, and that the signal of selection that they originally detected now with data from the whole genome was not unusual. So it's not clear. I mean, it's definitely functionally important, um, and so, um, but neither has there been a link to, uh, there, there's no, been no biological link to resistance to bubonic plague um, with that mutation, and the evidence of selection is not clear. So it was a fantastic paper, and it was a really great story, but I think actually with modern data, that, that's not likely to be the case. It's still in the textbook, so once, something's not, once something is a Nova special, there's nothing you can do. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So how can you tell the difference between, like, a bottleneck and, like, a small founder population mm -hmm. and evolutionary success? Okay, yeah, so how, yeah, absolutely. So the question is, how can you tell the difference between a bottleneck um, and selection and evolution? Um, and a bottleneck is essentially when the population gets very, very small. Uh, or right, a major contraction of the population, in which what will happen is you'll get a lot of these long haplotypes and a lot of changes in the allele frequency. Well, essentially that changes the whole genome. It's going to have that same impact on the whole genome. And in a way, you can think of selection as a bottleneck of just one point in the genome, right? And so what you're seeing is when a bottleneck affects all, the whole genome, it'll change the dynamic. And, uh, it, and essentially, we, we account for that. We do a lot of simulations of these different kinds of events and make sure that the tests we develop are robust to them. And that essentially, in a population like in Asia, there was a, in Africa, it seems to be that there was no bottleneck. In Europe and Asia, there were bottlenecks. And in Asia, it might be one of the stronger ones. Um, you can just see that it changes the whole dynamic. And what we're looking at, looking for, are outliers from that spectrum. Um, and so in a bottleneck population, you have to just be really, really long haplotype or really unusual spectrum to stand out. So it just basically, you're, you still are just looking for outliers from a distribution, um, things that just stand out from the, what's happening in the rest of the genome. Um, so it actually becomes hard, when a population bottlenecks, it's harder to find selection because it's harder for it to stand out. Okay. Awesome. Thank you.